In order to improve at 40k, there are some fundamental concepts. Hello and welcome to Epic Flail 40k Tactics. My name's Luke, and this week I will be mostly talking about 40k fundamentals. I'm going to break down the essential building blocks to becoming a better 40k player. By the end of this video, you'll have a strong idea of the foundational aspects of the game. Let's get started. One of the biggest reasons why players struggle to improve is because they don't fully understand their own army. Making the right decisions in a game and improving at the game is more than just about knowing what our units can do, it's understanding how to effectively apply them in different situations. If you're someone who's good at memorising units, that's fantastic, but start to think about how each unit fits into a larger strategy. Some really key questions that we can ask ourselves to help with this are Things like, what is the primary role of each unit in my army? What matchups are they strong in? And where would they struggle? How can I use this in the game to make sure I'm getting the most amount of activations out of it, or the most amount of value out of it for as many turns as possible? And the answer to that question is going to be different from matchup to matchup, but taking a moment before you start a game to try and ask some of those questions of your units, either in your head, or if you're playing casual games, have a chat with your opponent. I'm trying to improve and give you the best game I could possibly give, but I'm not familiar with some of the bits and pieces in your army, and consider asking those kind of questions to your opponent before the game begins, because if you're going into that game trying to get better, and you'd like to use this as an opportunity for you to learn, most people will be accommodating in that situation, and let's face it, I've rarely met a Warhammer player that doesn't like to talk shop. Most people are more than happy to talk about their army, what's good, what's bad, because at the end of the day, both players want to have a fun and engaging game. So a big part of how you can help yourself to understand your army if you're just picking up your army for the first time is to talk with your opponent ahead of the games that you play just before you're about to start. Be open and honest and try to draw out some of this help and support from that game. You don't want them to play the game for you, of course, but it's about having a candid conversation and saying, I'm trying to learn and I'd like to be able to use this game to help with that. So rather than me just pushing models around the table and you picking them off one by one, can we have a little conflab at the beginning and give me a bit of info to help? These sorts of things help greatly in us understanding our army. And again, after the game as well, if there was a unit that you thought underperformed, talk it through with your opponent. Do you think I used this unit in the right way? Seeking feedback is a really good way of learning and understanding the limitations and where we can get better. Ultimately, to really improve, we need to make informed decisions about things like positioning, threat management, and timing. And by thinking about the game in the ways that I've suggested, asking questions beforehand, seeking feedback afterwards, that can help us to break down how to structure a list that doesn't just look good on paper, but we can actually make good use of on the battlefield too. This next concept applies in almost every game of 40k, and that is the idea that there'll be a pivotal objective that is going to be heavily contested. This is where the major fights will take place between your opponent and yourself. Multiple points that you and your opponent will be fighting over throughout the game. And when we're building a list, there are multiple ways we can approach this. But the concept remains the same. We need to hold objectives. A common way that I see people try to do this is with a tanky unit. Something that's capable of dishing out some pain but they're also an anvil, something that's going to hold a point until you've got a hammer unit that can come in and deliver a decisive blow. Things like this are terminators or big tanks or big monsters. This is one way which we can try to hold an objective. I've talked about ways to double down on this in previous videos as well, but the key thing remains the same. The ability to hold objectives in 40k is crucial, and if you're playing a faction that doesn't have a durable unit, then something that can threaten board controls. A big nasty shooting unit could also be quite good, as if they're threatening some overwatch down one part of the board. That could be a problem for an opponent to deal with. Or maybe a really hard-hitting combat unit sat behind a ruined wall, but touching an objective. That is an unpleasant prospect for a lot of armies to deal with, because they don't want to stand on the objective and get charged next turn. But if they don't do anything about it, you're going to rack up points on that objective. So do they go around the side, put themselves out of position to try and get an angle with a ranged unit, or step closer to the objective and risk that counter charge? These are all different ways to hold an objective. One that's particularly fancy, which I saw on Stat Check recently, which was a video by Innes, who talked about his Outlander Claw detachment, where he had fast-moving scouting units with sticky objectives objectives where he could scout forwards at the beginning of the game, control an objective and sticky it, meaning he retains control of it even if that unit moves away from the objective, and then running that unit away from the objective. He had two small units of bikes that could go out and do that, which is eternally frustrating for his opponents because either they leave the objectives and Innes scores lots of points, or they run forward and have to put multiple units on objectives and expose those units to being shot at in the subsequent turn. So again, a very different approach to the options that I ran through just now, but something that was 
really effective for him to hold those objectives. If you want to see the full video, then check out statcheck.com. They do some great content. And ultimately, the key here is when building an army, we want to think about things that can either be holding out against what our opponent throws at us or other creative ways to try and hold the objectives. As more often than not, if we want to try and score more primary than our opponents, it will mean putting some stuff in harm's way. There's also the home objective, our HQ, our safe space. One that we can consistently hold with very little effort. View this one as something that needs babysitting rather than fighting over. We want units that are durable but don't necessarily need to contribute a ton of firepower or melee threat. Something that no one really wants to have to shoot at. But models that are just tough enough to hold the line if they were shelled by some indirect fire or if someone got an angle on them. It's tempting to put something like a unit of scouts on a home objective, but actually having something that can be a bit of a goalie, a bit of a protector of that objective is a good thing to think about. Something that's vaguely threatening, but not enough to draw a lot of attention. And depending on the texture of your list, maybe you want to go all in on castling up. This is something I've seen a lot with Astra Militarum, car parks, artillery pieces, or just big tanks sat at the back around a command bunker, dishing out orders and trying to rain down all sorts of pain from afar. And this serves a dual purpose of having lots of layers of stuff on that home objective. So you've really castled up and defended that objective. Conversely, something like gene stealer cults, where you could just have a small unit of hand flamer wielding acolytes and pop them on the objective. So if an opponent tries to get too close, they might get overwatched. Or a skull cannon in demons they're quite nice their combat is not to be sniffed at if you have something that's a bit fragile trying to sneak an objective off of you late in the game then something like a skull cannon can be quite a useful deterrent there's lots of ways of approaching that home objective and how you look after it and each one will have its merits but again it's a fundamental part of the game that we want to protect particularly if we were to draw the tactical mission that means we score points if we hold our own home objective defend stronghold I'm thinking about how we can best achieve this with the tools that we have at our disposal in our given faction. Before I get into the next one, don't forget to check out Epic Flail HQ. Paul and I post regular content every week over at Epic Flail HQ. And if you're enjoying the content that you're watching today and you want more of it, then over at Epic Flail HQ, I've done a whole host of members only videos that you can access for $2.99 a month. Not only that, if you're interested in watching UKTC coverage, then we've also done some of that with even more on the horizon. And so if you want to support that, as well as access to the ever-growing Epic Flail Discord, then check out Epic Flail HQ and become a member today. As well as our home objective, there is our opponent's home objective as well. And you know what they say, the best defense is a good offense. And any way that we have to strike at the heart of our opponents is often going to be a good thing. If we can deny that backfield objective, if they've left a chink in the armor, they've left a gap for us to pop a unit in, and stand on that objective and deny primary points that they weren't otherwise prepared for, then that's a big deal. Common ways where I see the home objective be wrenched away from opponent's control is if you have a scenario where a unit has charged in, killed something, and then consolidated a head into an opposing objective and stolen it away from the opponent that was left unawares because they weren't predicting that that unit would make it that far. They didn't necessarily consider the consolidate piling move. So if you've got screens or units that are in, deployed in layers at your home objective, that's something to bear in mind and take advantage of if your opponent has that as well. If you're thinking, oh, they've left a unit there, they're not overly fussed about whether I charge that unit. It might not be that threatening, but if I can charge that unit and then use that extra movement in the charge phase to slingshot over to our opponent's home objective, then we can really get a nice point swing on the subsequent turns when our opponent tries to score primary that they thought they were going to get. And actually, I've got some random combat units stood on it. Some really good units like this are jet bikes or squig riders, even orc buggies, custodies jet bikes, anything fast, even things like a seraphim, which can move really fast, advance, shoot, with bringers of flame detachment. Of course, even if they're not advancing, if they're in a different detachment, they can still move, shoot, and then move again. Eldar have a lot of that as well, move, shoot, move. Or if you have units with reactive moves, run a unit because at the board or a unit of acolyte hybrids in GSC, run them up the board and just stand them in front of the enemy. They've not had enough movement to quite get a charge or they failed a charge or they've killed something and then they've consolidated and they're just in the open. If you've got that reactive move, if they're shot, that's awkward for an opponent to have to deal with because they're potentially going to run at the opponent and then onto the objective, which is a nightmare. So Things like that can be nasty to threaten that backfield objective or anything with deep strike. Three inch deep strikes are particularly troublesome. You want to make sure that you've screened out sufficiently around your home objective. And if your opponent's left a little gap where you can do a three inch deep strike, if you've got that in your army, that's a good way to steal that as well. It forces our opponents into making 
annoying decisions. You might have thrown something largely insignificant, but it will divert resources away. And even if you just deny scoring for a turn on that primary objective, that could be enough to really to put a dent in your opponent's scores. And in those scenarios, it's well worth throwing a unit away like that to get those points. A term you might have heard before is action monkey. In 10th, many secondary objectives require actions or movement to a place with the unit and that's where our action monkeys come in so basically this refers to anything that's cheap a small enough unit with either deep strike fast movement ability or infiltrate basically a way of getting around the board to score points without engaging directly in combat shooting things like ripper swarms nurglings flayed ones they're a great one because they're actually quite threatening in combat but they're still quite cheap as well Storm Boys for Orcs, Seraphim, which I mentioned before. Not your heroic units. We won't be singing songs about their deeds in years to come, but they will add to our ability to score points and they can make or break our secondary objectives. So prioritize keeping them cheap. And if we've got small units that are running around doing an action, we're going to feel a lot happier about a five man unit of Gene Stealers doing deploy teleport homers versus a full 10 with a patriarch leading them doing teleport homers. That 10 strong unit wants to be running at the opponent and ripping things to shreds, not deploying teleport homers or doing actions. So an amount of cheap expendable units to run around and do the do the dirty work, the action monkey jobs is important in our lists and a fundamental part of what Model 40k is. And lastly, probably one of the most important tools of 10th edition, something that wasn't always a 40k fundamental, but in recent years has certainly become one, and that is Rapid Ingress. This is simply one of the most powerful stratagems in the game, and it can bring reserves on in our opponent's movement phase, allowing us that key movement in our turn to set up critical plays with combat units or short-ranged shooting units. We want to reserve something that's gonna hit hard when it arrives, and when we Rapid Ingress it, we need to be making sure that it's either well hidden or well protected, or both, so that we can then activate it in our turn unimpeded and get some real value out of these powerful hammer units. If nothing else, what Rapid Ingress does is it forces our opponents to react to our movements. And if they don't, we can set up these full plays and really punish them for not respecting it. If we have this up our sleeves and we're threatening to apply pressure, they have to decide whether to deal with it or let us just have the board. Don't sleep on Rapid Ingress. If it's a stratagem that you're not using in your games, a little challenge from me would be to force yourself to give you the option of it every game. So have something that you can Rapid Ingress in every game that could potentially be quite a threatening unit to bring on and take a little note of how it affects your opponent's decisions and approaches to the game. With 40k there are a lot of different units involved and one of the unit types that I touched on very recently was dedicated transports which you can find here. If you found this video useful then I recommend this one as a really good next step as it talks about a unit type that not every faction has access to. So it's well worth a watch as you might find some things that you weren't familiar with. In the meantime, that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching. Keep rolling those dice and stay tuned for more.